A large crowd gathered on New Year's Day in 1911. They had come to see some newfangled invention called a flying machine. The pilot landed right on the lawn of the Potter Hotel in Santa Barbara. A young man in the crowd was so moved by the sight, he decided to make aviation his life. He became one of the most prolific designers in history, with over 50 planes to his credit. designing a plane Lockheed thought would keep them in the aviation business after the war. He sat on the beach studying seagulls, trying to figure out how they could land so slowly, and soon saw how they tilted their wings, nearly vertical, just before landing. He designed the bottom wings to rotate so pilots could slow for landing, and went a step farther. Jack made the wings so they folded. Now the owner could tow it to the nearest cow pasture for flight. But Lockheed didn't count on thousands of jennies being sold as war surplus for only $400. And then later, after the Lockheed uh, operation in Santa Barbara folded for lack of business and finances, I went to Santa Monica in 1923 to work for Dud. So the morning I was supposed to report there, I went in with fear and trembling, my knees knocking together, I can assure you. And the first job they gave me was the designing of the uh, fairing on this particular airplane. And so I didn't know a doggone thing about putting a fairing on a steel tube fuselage airplane, and I was absolutely petrified. And along came noon, and I managed to gobble a little lunch, and this made me so ill that I went home. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning, I approached the job again, not knowing whether I was going to last through the morning or not, but fortunately, somebody else had been started on the fairing, and I got a job designing aluminum gas tanks, and this I knew how to do, and everything was lovely. <laughs> the gas tanks were for the famous world cruisers, the first planes to circle the globe. Jack followed with designs for an observation plane for the Army, a torpedo aircraft for the Navy, and a passenger plane for the airline. The Army also used it as a cargo plane in the first aerial refueling. A mail plane for Western Airlines was next. It was recently restored and flown back to the Smithsonian. Sunberg had seen ads in the aviation magazine, and he liked a little uh, model we call the M1. The very first airplane was overweight, as airplanes are sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Jack Northrop, 
So I asked him if he could do a little moonlighting. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, provided that uh, Doug will agree, and for quite a few weeks, they came down to San Diego and redesigned for us the wing, and uh, made a much better airplane that really performed then. And incidentally, that exact same wing stretched out was the wing that uh, was on the Spur of St. Louis. The planes Jack was working on at Douglas were quite conventional. He wanted to design more efficient aircraft. I had a little drafting board at home, and in the latter part of 1926, I laid out a, a nice, clean, little high-wing uh, monoplane design. Jack showed the plans to Alan Lockheed. The whole objective was to build as clean an airplane as we could possibly conceive in those days. The, uh, the average airplane had struts or wires or uh, fuselage forms that weren't as smooth, as streamlined, as low drag as possible, and it was pretty obvious. It seemed to me that a full cantilever wing, uh, neatly paired to the fuselage, would take less power to do a, a job than some other type. With just the three views, they were able to raise the money to found the present Lockheed Company in 1927. Vega first flew from a bean field now known as LAX. Jack Vega carried two of his pilots to aviation fame. Wiley Post flew his Vega solo around the world, and then in a man from Mars suit, climbed to a record 55,000 feet. Amelia Earhart flew her Vega solo across the Atlantic, then solo across the Pacific. Amelia's Little Red Wagon and Wiley's Winnie Mae are both proudly displayed in the Smithsonian. The Vega was efficient, but Jack wanted to do even better. He founded his own company in 1928. I wanted basically to build an airplane where there was nothing but the wing, where everything was included in it, power plant, passengers, every function that was necessary in a wing. Well, Mr. Belandi, this plane is quite a little different than those you've been used to flying. The wings are all metal and plenty heavy enough and strong enough so that a person can walk out over them almost anywhere. All right, Eddie. Well, if you're all set, let's go. Goodbye, Eddie. When designing his flying wing, Jack developed a new method of constructing all-metal airplanes. It proved to be a quantum leap in strength for aviation. The Great Depression was beginning. Jack had to put aside his flying wing and concentrate on conventional airplanes. The first real airplane we built in this new company in early 1930 was called the Northrop Alpha. And this was built uh, completely wing fuselage and tail surfaces of this monocoque sheet metal or nested channel structure. Uh, these airplanes were used uh, to pioneer uh, all weather or night flying. On an early test flight, one crashed. A steamroller was working nearby. Jack asked the driver to crush the remaining wing so it could be hauled away. The wing wasn't even dented. And we had a story about one of the early airmail pilots who was forced into a restricted field and had to ground loop the airplane very violently, and he bent the wing up at about 45 degrees. And they sent a crew out from Kansas City, where the plane was based, bent the wing down with some block and tackle and flew it back in for a more permanent repair. <laughs> the depression deepened. Jack sold his company to Bill Boeing and went back to work for Donald Douglas. But his Alpha had become a standard. TWA requested proposals for an all-metal airliner, far superior to the trimotors they were flying. 
Douglas responded, The wing shall be of cellular multi-web construction, similar to the North Alpha. The outer wing panel shall be demountable from the center wing by means of a continuous flange bolted joint, similar to that used on the North Alpha. The fuselage shall be... one became the DC-3. It was copied by every airframe builder in the world. The Alpha had revolutionized the entire aviation industry in only a few years. TWA recently restored one of their Alphas. It hangs in the Smithsonian next to the DC-3. Jack refined his design. The Beta, a 200 mile per hour private plane in 1933. Then the record-breaking Gamma. New York, millionaire, movie producer, and record-breaking aviator Howard Hughes. In his Northrop plane with the right cyclone engine, he spanned the continent in nine and a half hours, breaking all records. Well, the weather was good from beginning to end, except for about two hours of blind flying between Kingman and Santa Fe, New Mexico. I flew at 18,000 feet. TWA converted a gamma to an over-the-weather flying laboratory. Tommy Tomlinson's research made possible the pressurized comfort we have on airliners today. Jack began modifying the Gamma for combat. It served as the basic design for many World War II fighters. Jack wanted to return to his flying wing. He left Douglas and formed his own company again in 1939, the present Northrop Corporation. He sketched his ideas for completely eliminating the tail and designed the N1M, Northrop mock-up number one. It is being restored by the Smithsonian. A plane of unusual interest is demonstrated at Rosamond Dry Lake in the Mojave Desert. It is the latest model of the Northrop Flying Wing. Developed from designs originated by Mr. Northrop in 1923, this bat-like plane is devised to use all its surface for useful lift. The elimination of non-lift elements such as tail and fuselage is what does the trick. The Northrop Corporation estimates that general application of this principle would result in speed increase up to 100 miles an hour with no extra power. And it is thought that this design will make construction 30 to 40 percent cheaper. It may revolutionize airplane engineering. This plane, as you see it, is really a flying laboratory. And in the present arrangement, it represents one of 15 or 20 different configurations that we've tested in about 200 flights made to date. We believe that we've solved most of the problems connected with the development of the flying wing and that this type of plane will have considerable problems for future use. Norway needed a plane to defend herself. Jack quickly designed a patrol bomber. His employees responded. Working round the clock, they delivered the N3PB in a record nine months. hundreds of bulky vengeances and thousands of parts for the B-17. The Battle of Britain taught us a painful lesson. The Army wanted a plane designed specifically for night fighting. 
Jack responded, ultra secret, radar equipped, black widow. Even as the war ended, it was soon apparent we were to have no lasting peace. With a snark, the first intercontinental cruise missile, its guidance system so exact, charts of the Caribbean had to be redrawn to match its accuracy. The F-89 Scorpion was designed with Jack as chief engineer. lethal plane of its era. The country's most important need was for a long-range bomber. Jack proposed a giant flying wing. To prove the concept, he began with a one-third scale version, the N9M. B-35 was an impressive airplane. Able to lift an amazing 140% of its weight in useful payload, unmatched until the debut of the 747 20 years later. Jack also saw his wing as an airliner. Now, a preview of the flying wing transport of tomorrow. The midsection provides ample room for 80 passengers. Spaciousness keynotes the luxurious main lounge, extending 53 feet inside the wing. And future air travelers will really see something. Through the plexiglass windows of the front wing edge, passengers have an unimpaired view of the Earth, unrolling thousands of feet below. Coast-to-coast -coast flights in four hours may not be too far away. The dorsal tip of the plane provides an excellent vantage point to see the world go by. Snug as bugs in their magic carpet, Air travelers can look down on mere earthlings as the double quartet of mighty turbojets whistle them through space. The sleek air leviathan carries more cargo farther, faster, and with less fuel than any comparable plane. And the bar will raise the spirits of those who don't feel high enough in the stratosphere. The flying wing has the stability of a fine club. The public quickly accepts all the miracles that science provides. Even skyliners like this will become commonplace. But the giant flying wing is more than a super streamlined airplane. It is the fulfillment of scientific vision and symbolizes the practical dreams of science for our world of tomorrow. The wings were converted to the newly developed jet engines in 1947 and became even more efficient. Cruising at over 500 miles per hour, they could easily outdistance enemy fighters even outmaneuver them. But politicians got involved in the final selection process. Although the wing was far superior to the competition, it was canceled in 1949. Then, in one of the most controversial political decisions ever, all wings were ordered cut up for scrap. But the concept was not destroyed. Today, Boeing and others are seriously investigating the flying wing because of its lifting power and fuel efficiency. When equipped with today's powerful engines, a flying wing can lift an unbeatable 210% of its weight and carry the same payload as a conventional airplane at over 600 miles per hour, but consume only 70% as much fuel. Jack's determination to design the most efficient airplane in the world produced his masterpiece.
across the years. Is there anything that sticks out in your mind you say, by golly, that was fun? Well, I have to go back to uh, a day in the office of Don Douglas where four or five of the engineering department worked there and Doug had gone east to uh, try to get a, an order for a number of additional airplanes and we all were waiting there with our fingers crossed. So Doug sent a telegram and he said, let all engineers go except Mankey and Northrop. And that was the most satisfying. <laughs> <laughs>